Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Democratic Socialists of America's International Committee's panel on Yemen, titled Yemen Rises, Counter-Hegemony and Solidarity in the Red Sea. Um, before we start, I just want everyone to know we will be recording this webinar and sharing it on YouTube. Um, we will have a Q&A feature embedded in the Zoom. Um, feel free to ask any questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. We will field the questions, so we won't be able to get to all of them. And if you have questions that were unanswered, please, yeah, feel free to email us at this uh, at this email address. Um, and yeah, before I do the introductions, I'm just going to go over the agenda real quick. Um, today, we will be talking about the situation in the Arab Iranian region, um, particularly how uh, Yemen has stood up for um, for Palestine in, in this in this really inspiring and and um, sort of material way. Um, we will also be looking at a deeper history, um, both of Yemen in the twentieth century and then more recent. Um, as it relates to the war on terror. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A where we'll hopefully get to answer as many of the questions as possible. We'll have the resources that all of our wonderful panelists um, have shared with us and hopefully, um, yeah. And then we'll get to our closing remarks. Um, so, yeah, I will first introduce the panelists then I'll introduce myself and then I'll just have a quick couple minutes to just give a couple of facts and figures. Um, we have really, really, I'm uh, really excited about our panelists. So um, first, we will be speaking with uh, Max Isle. Uh, Max Isle is a senior fellow at the University of Tunis and an associated researcher at the Tunisian Observatory for Food Sovereignty and the Environment. He is an associate editor at Agrarian South and a uh, journal of labor and society and he's written for the journal of peasant studies the review of african political economy and his book highly recommend people's green new deal was published in 2021 with pluto press um next we will have rune eierhaus i practiced that before it um, and he said I actually nailed it, so we'll see if I did that. Um, he is a political analyst, producer, and editor with eight years of experience covering the Yemeni political affairs and history. He's a coordinator with the International Commission for Solidarity with Yemen, which seeks to facilitate communication between Yemeni and foreign political organizations. He's a founder of Hamra Books, an upcoming nonprofit book publisher focused on unearthing and republishing progressive literature from the Arabian Peninsula. He holds a bachelor's degree in international studies, and he is currently pursuing a master's degree in international relations with a focus on Yemen. It's also a fantastic Twitter account to follow because he just um, has a wealth of credible archival footage that uh, is really priceless. Um, and then we'll be closing out with uh, Jihan Hakim. Jihan is a second generation Yemeni American Muslim woman and mother of four. She is a Bay Area native who now resides in Houston, Texas. Jihan is a community organizer and DEI consultant and educator. Jihan is also founder of the Yemen Alliance Committee. Um, my name is Sammy Liriani, um, I will be your moderator. And if I can just have a few moments of your time, I'm not gonna take much. It's just, I'd like to just read a few facts and figures to set the table a little bit um, about the situation in Yemen. Um, since the US backed Saudi led coalition began its war and blockade uh, to oust Ansar Allah, Yemen has become what UNICEF called in 2022, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Since 2015, estimates say over 400,000 Yemenis have perished, 
60% of those deaths are the result of starvation or lack of medical resources as a direct result of the blockade. In 2023, 21.6 million people required some form of humanitarian assistance. 80% of the population struggles to access food, safe drinking water, and adequate health services. 4.5 million people have been displaced. Maternity mortality rates in Yemen remain the highest in the Middle East and North African region. And I, <clears throat> these are just a few quick stats. Um, I could go on, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, I'll leave it with this, actually. Uh, throughout the humanitarian crisis, the coalition has conducted over 26,000 air raids. Uh, the United States continues to back the war and blockade to the hilt with intelligence and strategic support. And the United States supplies conservatively 78% of Saudi Arabia's military equipment. And I say that not to engender despair or sort of give an impression of Yemen as like a hopeless situation, but to give a small idea of the conditions that Yemenis are under as they continue to fight for sovereignty and the liberation of Palestine. Um, so with that said, thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Max Isle. Um, attendees, thank you to the organizers. Um, thank you to my fellow speakers for sharing their their insights with us. Um, thank you to uh, the, the DSA International Committee. Also a shout out to whatever troll is recording this, but don't worry, everything we say is going to be correct and principled. So get lost. Um, so I am uh, going to just very briefly um, and not at great length because I want to keep it open for um, the discussions from the audience um, who are seeking to better understand uh, specific issues. Um, just clarify uh, my interpretation of U.S. Uh, geopolitics and yeah. overall imperial strategy as it uh, hits into the Arab-Iranian region. Uh, I say Arab Iran, Arab Iranian region because we uh, it's a, a mainstay of the Arab nationalist thinking to understand it as uh, an Arab region. Um, other, the Middle East is actually attempt to normalize the presence of uh, Israel, which is uh, not an Arab state within the region, um, and Iran has had longstanding and organic connections uh, for uh, thousands of years with Iraq and is also um, a central actor that is acting in defense of uh, state sovereignty in the region. Right? Um, I think it, there, there's a source of confusion that's often engendered when we get into discussions of the Arab-Iranian region. Um, often uh, with, with the presupposition that uh, the U.S. policy is irrational, right? Um, and uh, the the corollary of that is, of course, that there is a rational policy that the U.S. should be following. Um, and I think this is often a confusion between uh, often first people are, it puts us in the role of kind of spectators of um, the empire, kind of giving it advice about what to do and uh, you know when in fact we don't really want an empire. Um, two, it, it, it suggests that the ruling class is kind of intrinsically stupid, right? And uh, three, it suggests that the ruling class is irrational. Um, and, and four, of course, it slides very quickly in some misunderstandings or misapprehensions that might state that uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, minority is running U.S. foreign policy as opposed to the minority called uh, the ruling class in the state as its executive uh, committee. So, you know, during the Arab, uh, the, the kind of heyday of Arab republicanism, it was very transparent that the U.S. had an enemy. The enemy were these Arab republican governments, which uh, with their lights and shadows were uh, nationalizing industrial plants, increasing um, uh, developmental levels on every index imaginable from like the period from 1952 to 1970, uh, were uh, carrying out partial industrial articulation in the country, were taking some steps, greater or lesser, to break the structure of, uh, of the feudal agrarian structure inherited from uh, the Ottoman period and then uh, the colonial period and so forth, right? And it was transparent that these 
countries were enemies and uh and it was furthermore transparent when uh the with respect to the more marxist uh, parties which actually assumed state power um which i'm sure we're going to hear a lot more from rune that that these were fundamental antagonists to the us and they carried clear red banners and this made things kind of simple right uh since 1990 the U.S. has not really been, uh, you know, with with the the partial with partial exceptions, right? The U.S.'s targets uh, have been to undo, not not to stall countries that are carrying out redistribution, but much more to undo existing developmental achievements and to actually level countries themselves. That is to reduce the net capital stock, to reduce the developmental levels, to reduce the level of external industrialization, um, to create massive labor reserves, um, also to uh, around any country that didn't have substantial oil pools that are integrated in the U.S. geopolitical orbit. So this is, for example, why uh, Iraq and Libya were extensively targeted. And of course, Iran started to be placed under a punishing sanctions regime as well, right? So the US goal, in fact, outside of its uh, neo-colonial alliances has in fact been uh, the breaking of developmental levels, the de-development of the Arab region. And of course, this has been accomplished through uh, the attack on the post-colonial system of political sovereignty, that is Westphalian sovereignty, that is states actually having a relative modicum of ability to determine what goes on inside their borders, right, including expelling, uh, not allowing the presence of uh, foreign troops inside their borders, right? Uh, no one can deny that this is actually the policy. This is the policy because the policy is one, this way you maintain uh, specifically the system of US petrodollars. But furthermore, what you maintain, right, is uh, you, you, you put a hit on the morale, on the ideology and the capacity to resist of the uh, US um, of the of the Arab working classes, but also because Palestine is such a symbol that uh, it also became uh, becomes a way of instilling a sense of defeat amongst the working classes on a world scale, right? <laughs> and so, what we've seen even more aggressively since then, since uh, since 1991, and then escalating furthermore in 2003, are nonstop U.S. wars in the region. Right. And it's very easy to list that. You see wars and sanctions regimes imposed on Iraq, on Iraq again, on Lebanon through the U.S. proxy Israel, on Palestine under constant occupation, uh, post-2011 on Libya, on uh, Syria, and then uh, post-2014, uh, 2015, escalating on Yemen alongside sanctions regimes and terror listing. The terror listing is applied to the countries that hold the banner, which is in opposition to the uh, policies or the existence of the US and Israel, right? And of course, Iran is very much behind all of these uh, non-state or state movements it behind in the sense of supporting at some level or another all these non-state movements that are some are actually fighting for uh, some kind of sovereign development. I mean, we can take, for example, Ansar Allah's uh, documents, which I won't go into because someone else will, but the rest of them are actually fighting for political sovereignty. Why? Political sovereignty is the envelope within which you can actually have a developmental policy. You cannot do things like agrarian reform if you don't control your state borders and if you have military bases in your on your country itself. And you cannot decide what to do with your oil revenues if the U.S. military bases are in your oil-rich regions, as is the case in Syria. You cannot decide if you want to do an industrialization project if you actually have to use industrial, your tiny bit of industrial capacity to produce weapons so that you aren't genocided, which is what's happening in Gaza, right? So the, the policy uh, the policy itself is de-development and uh, for those reasons. And the resistance to it takes the form in our current era with all its lights and shadows of defending or trying to achieve political sovereignty, sometimes occurring uh, through a very committed international solidarity, in particular, uh, Yemen is the lodestar of this. And this is how we can actually make sense of what's going on in the region. And this provides, I think, a great interpretive frame uh, that is quite substantially correct, that allows us both to interpret the US agenda, which we don't need, to, which we can interpret just simply by saying, okay, what is the US actually doing how can we make sense of it? And this also says, okay, this is how we interpret 
the very projects that are not in accord with the U.S. agenda, right? And this is why, of course, Yemen, uh, which actually is having uh, some uh, some socially redistributionist elements within its alliance, within its governmental alliance, um, in addition to its internationalist commitments, has really come under the U.S. Uh, military gun site. So uh, I'm going to leave it there because uh, we, we all need to speak and contribute our part. So uh, I'll stop and we'll go on to the next person. And I look forward to the questions. Well, that's fantastic. That was amazing table setting for what the stakes are. Um, and I'm, um, yeah, that was really clarifying. Uh, next we have Rune, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Max, for that incredible anal analysis. Um, and of course, thank you to, um, the other panelists, and of course to the DSA IC for. Uh, for hosting this incredibly important event. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I will go through, just very briefly go through the history or the contemporary history of Yemen. Um, because there's this um, narrative that is dominating both the current discourse surrounding Yemen and the Ansar Allah uh, today in the, especially in the mainstream media, but also by a plethora of DC-based think tank so-called analysts that would like to claim that the Ansar Allah, um, you know, established itself in a vacuum, uh, detached from Yemen's general history and material conditions. Um, it's quite the opposite, actually. Um, so Yemen today, Yemen, modern Yemen is a fairly new creation. Um, it's only around 34 years old, um, and it used to be separated for hundreds of years. Yemen has been dealing with uh, colonial powers ever since its inception as a nation state, basically. So you had the, in the uh, early 1500s, you had the Portuguese trying but failing inevitably to conquer Aden in the south. And you had the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire also, who had a uh, clear um, goal of conquering Yemen, or what was really North Yemen, which was which was the only really um, organized nation state at the time. Um, and of course, you had the British who held onto uh, Aden from 1839 until 1967. Um, so Yemen has always been dealing with colonial powers, colonial uh, uh, enroachment of of the country and has been paying dearly for it for hundreds of years. Um, but specifically, what also often gets ignored in the general debate surrounding the country is the policy of Saudi Arabia towards the country. Um, so the war that began in 2015 is not a new phenomenon. In fact, it's only a a um, it's only a uh, you know one part of a longer um, policy that Saudi Arabia has um, been having towards the country uh, ever since. We I mean we could go back to 1922 with the uh, infamous Tanoma massacre in which uh, Saudi tribesmen slaughtered around 1,200 Yemeni pilgrims on their way to Mecca. Um, but really where the policy of Saudi Arabia towards Yemen really begins to form in what you could argue is, is you know, still is its current form is around the 1930s, right? So you had a brief but exceptionally brutal war in 1934 where, you know, between the uh, imam at the time, uh, Imam Yahya al-Mutawakil, uh, who, you know, rose to power uh, in what was then the Mutawakilite Kingdom of Yemen uh, in 1918 with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. Um, so, um, by that time, Saudi Arabia had already been a very or a fairly new nation-state creation, right? So, two years prior to this war, it it was founded in 1932, and then two years later, in 1934, it went to war with Yemen 
for three, primarily three provinces in the north. So you had um, uh, Jisan, Ladron, and uh, Asir, who were not really part of Yemen per se, but were like fiefdoms highly interconnected with Yemen. And they had like uh, um, defense treaties with the sitting imam at the time. Saudi Arabia next these three regions, a border dispute that was only resolved in the year 2000s between Ali Abdullah Saleh and the sitting Saudi king at the time. But if we scroll through contemporary Yemeni history throughout the 20th century, right? So you have the war of uh, the, the war in North Yemen that began with the Republican Revolution 1962, um, it, which lasted until 1970 between Republican forces backed by Egypt and, and Royalist forces backed by the UK and, and Saudi Arabia. There was a clear attempt at the time to, to force Yemen because you, you, know, you, had, you had the colonial empires, the UK primarily, exceptionally afraid that with the Republican revolution or you know, coup revolution, however you want to call it, with the Republican rise to power, they feared Yemen would once again, you know, try to um, detach itself from colonial dominance. And they absolutely could not, you know, allow for that to happen. So they, you know, poured in arms, money, weapons to the royalists. And, you know, eventually the war had, had it out, its ups and downs, but eventually um, the Republicans succeed. They uh, arise victorious. But at the time, Saudi Arabia said they could only um, recognize the new Republican government in the north if uh, the royalists who were overthrown in 1962, if they were allowed to you know, get some kind of state power in a power sharing deal. And that was very deliberate. Another factor also important to mention is that um, the Republicans, or Saudi Arabia especially, forced the right-leaning Republicans to basically force, you know, the left-leaning Republicans out of power um, to ensure that Saudi Arabian influence would uh, prevail in the north at the very least. And many of these uh, left-leaning Republican offices then went to the south, which had also experienced its own anti-colonial struggle against, you know, the, the direct British colonial dominance of Aden and, and you know, peripheral regions surrounding the Aden colony. Um, and there's, you know, if we then scroll back to like the 1970s, you know, Aden had, you know, the, you know, uh, delinked itself from the colonial dominance of Britain and the North is then, you know, proclaimed a, a republic for the first time. There's a set of events that are different in scope and size, but still very interconnected. Uh, in, in around 1973, 1974, North Yemen experiences once again a coup, bloodless coup actually, uh, which sees the uh, Yemeni army colonel, colonel uh, Ibrahim al-Hamdi uh, rise to power. And Ibrahim al-Hamdi was exceptionally popular. He was perhaps the most popular president Yemen has ever had in in history. Even until this day, there's no president that it, you know, exceeds the popularity that Ibrahim al-Hamdi had, you know, among his people. Um, but he his idea was that Yemen was still very much chained in this. Uh, colonial, post-colonial uh, condition of, you know, perpetual poverty with with no with no way out or no way to to really, you know, for the country to rise above the the, uh, the you know poverty levels. And he instituted agrarian reforms. He uh, enacted, uh, you know greater political freedoms for his people. He, but most importantly, he abolished the tribal ministry, Ministry of Tribal Affairs, which was at the time sort of Saudi Arabia's main gateway into the country at the time, at least in North Yemen. And one other policy that he also was very famous for was his um, 
policy of you know restarting or starting at the very least uh, reunification talks or unification talks actually with the southern Yemeni nation state um and it you know eventually it it ends up being that Ibrahim al Hamdi is assassinated two days prior to a very important or what would have been a very important unification uh, dialogue with his southern counterparts. Um, a year later, the sitting head of state in South Yemen, uh, Salim Rubay Ali, was also murdered in a coup that many perceive to be uh, intertwined or interlinked with uh, Ibrahim al Hamdi's murder. And of course, you know, the, the, the specific details surrounding these two events, which are so incredibly important and really forces like a detour, 180 degree detour of Yemeni uh, progress. Um, the details are still very shrouded in secrecy, but it is widely assumed that Saudi Arabia paid for both assassinations, right? So, and then, you know, if we scroll back a bit further in the timeline, you know, uh, Salim Rubay Ali is pushed out of of uh, of power or of influence. He's murdered in a, a an internal power struggle. Uh, he had very you know Maoist Chinese uh, uh, leaning views as opposed to his counterparts, which were much more close to the Soviet Union. So he had he had a natural very good relationship with Ibrahim Al Hamdi, who also refused to 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 categorize himself into like the the, uh, the 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 poles of you know uh of the cold war at the time he was very much like an independent third world head of state and and he was also very popular for that reason but if you you know if we scroll a bit forward in the timeline you know you have Saul, uh, uh, ali abdullah saleh rose to rise to power in 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 north yemen who would then become yemen's long time dictator um, he was at 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 a at a certain point Saudi Arabia's primary puppet figurehead in Yemen, because you know they had already gotten rid of Ibrahim Al Hamdi, who they couldn't control, and Hamdi also in turn refused to be controlled by anybody. They had gotten rid of him, and they had gotten rid of Salim Rubay Ali. And at some point around 1990 or the late 1980s, Saudi Arabia now had two figureheads in both Yemeni nation states that they could sort of talk to and the U.S. could talk to. And with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there was now a an, an economic incentive for the two countries to reunify, an economic incentive that wasn't there when both Al-Hamdi and Rubay Ali were uh, head, heads of state of their respective nations. Um, and that also fails. I mean, the reunification in 1990 falls apart four years later with the war, uh, the civil war, where the South tries to, uh, you know, to, to, to secede from from this young union, um, primarily because Saudi, Ali Abdullah Saleh at the time had um, been engaging in a very meticulous and a very deliberate campaign of getting rid of all the socialists from the country. Um, very much, you know, in line with consistent Saudi policy, uh, because you know one thing is Saudi Arabia had always feared that Yemen would become this radical nation on their doorstep that they couldn't control or they couldn't you know push around as they've been used to. Um, they very much saw the benefit in having the two nations separated, right? So in 1994, Saudi Arabia pursued this two-pronged policy of giving or paying lip service to southern secessionist leaders saying you know you know we'll we'll support you financially and we'll support you militarily and if you ever you know succeed in in becoming your own state again we'll you know pour billions of petrodollars into your economy and and on the other hand they told Ali Abdullah Saleh to push through with his murderous campaign in the south to you know, make sure that Yemen would once again become two separate states. Ultimately, that fails. Saudi Arabian policy fails in that regard, but it succeeds wherein 
they um, are lucky enough to maintain that level of economic and political control that they've held over Yemen for so long, right? So what really happens is Yemen stays one union, but Saudi Arabia still controls uh, the economic policy, the appointment of the prime minister, the uh, political policy, the foreign policy, every facet of Yemeni government governance is still very much in the firm hands of the Saudi regime. And that all changes in 2014, 2015, with the rise of the Ansar Allah, um, which then again, you know, turns Yemen into this revolutionary nation that Saudi Arabia had always feared, right? So the rise of the Ansar Allah, they have their own roots and their own material conditions, you know, with the impoverished uh, uh, conditions in, in Sada region in the north. Um, but it's very much also, they're very much also driven by that progressive ideal of, um, you know, taking back the the uh, the uh, the affairs of their own country, and you know, detaching their country from Saudi influence, American influence, uh, b British economic influence from the uh, oil conglomerates, from the uh, you know, Bretton Woods institutions, you know, the IMF and the World Bank, uh, which had, you know, under Ali Abdullah Saleh's rule, forced Yemen into this liberal capitalist paradigm that the country wasn't simply ready for. Uh, so that also contributes very much to the, um, you could say, the uh, the uh, the popularity of the Ansar Allah by Yemen's progressive forces. So that was, you know, short rundown of of the history in that regard. Thank you so much, Rune. That was exceptional. Um, I I I love that you uh spoke about Alhamdi because there is. There's always this this sort of romantic feeling of like what what if he hadn't been uh, assassinated? I think that was like a big um, theme um, among people who yeah sort of um, imagined what what Yemen would be like under out out, out from under Saudi Arabia's thumb. Um, so next we have Jihan, um, and whenever you're ready, Jihan. I'm we're, we're ready for you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to, I'm so sorry to DSA and all the folks who are in attendance today and to all the other speakers. I'm going to be talking about more like the um, modern situation. I think Ron, I'm not, I know I'm saying your name wrong, uh, stopped at um, 2014, 2015. So I think my um, the lens that I'm going to be trying to share is kind of the modern role of the U.S., uh, in Yemen. So um, the war on terror over the last couple of decades. So, you know, if we look at uh, modern U.S. policies, for example, in the post-war uh, on ter terror era, since 9-11, America, as, as you know, in addition to the U.K. and, and other partners, um, have militarized every aspect of its war and policies, right? Like long-standing tensions between, you know, values and interests tilt abruptly always in favor of an, an extreme counter-terror appro approach, right? For Yemen, the war on terror has meant routine drone strikes, which continue until today under the AUMF, authorize authorization uh, to use military force, detaining and torturing Yemeni nationals in Guantanamo Bay, which continues to be open, the NSEERS program, which is the essentially the old Muslim registry, uh, which stands for the National Security Entry exit registration system where uh, Yemeni and other Muslim majority countries, uh, anytime they would enter the U.S. go through extreme vetting and screening and secondary um, uh, search. Uh, and also in addition to systemic Islamophobia, uh, which continue until today and, and continue to impact Arab Arabs and Muslims uh, in the states here and include immigration processing, delays, FBI harassment, 
racial profiling, entrapment, all, all of these issues. So, you know, um, just to kind of remind us what, what happened in Yemen. You know, in 2011, the Arab Spring took the Middle East and North Africa or the MENA by storm and a democratic wave entered Yemen fairly early. Right after Tunis and Egypt, Yemenis, especially the youth and women, poured into the streets um, protesting in a country that is highly armed. Second to the U.S. per capita, per capita, the protests were peaceful. The goal was to remove Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was at the time, uh, you know, over three decades. Decades, a dictator, a dictator for over three decades, uh, a removal of him and also the entire system that he upheld, um, and and insisting on a fair and free elections. So Yemenis were on the same page; they wanted change, right? So Saleh was defeated in in May of that year. So there was a vacuum, um, and that that needed to be filled, and that's where Al Islah or the Brotherhood. Uh, they stepped in. They wanted to fill that that space. Uh, eventually, Al Abdullah Saleh was forced to step down, and his vice president Mansour Hadi he took over, and he eventually wins the election, where he's the only president running, uh, and he vowed to make changes. Um, Hadi's term expired in 2013, and then the parliament gave him another year's extension. So there's a lot of patience uh, from the uh, side of the Yemenis. All all Yemenis were waiting. You know, they're there wasn't any violence at the time, um, but status quo continued as usual. Um, and there's there's probably where you heard that Ansar Allah marched up to Sana'a and they put Hadi on house arrest, uh, trying to force him to move things along towards uh, the unity government that they had already discussed previously, that was supposed to represent multiple players in the country. Um, and, and then outside of the palace, uh, there uh, the civil war broke out. Um, so I want to just make a quick distinction because we oftentimes see in the news, especially in the West, I live in America, um, we hear civil war. So the civil war was from 2014 until 2015. So let me tell you what happened in 2015. Because ha There's no war that's civil, right? No such thing as a civil war. Like war is never civil. Um, but in 2015, um, those things changed. Um, uh, like I said, Hadi uh, was, you know, lollygagging, taking his time, um, and he was tired of being cornered by Ansar Allah. So he fled to Saudi Arabia, where he still is today, actually. Um, that's where Hadi, uh, Malik bin Salman, Prince of Saudi Arabia, and uh, Obama began communicating, and they assembled a coalition. We, America is so good at assembling coalitions, you guys. Um, anyways, they assembled a coalition, calling it Operation Decisive Storm. So this was supposed to last for two months. Uh, and this is how it started. On the eve of March 26, 2015, Saudi Arabia, under the leadership of Malik bin Salman, launched airstrikes on Yemen, abruptly escalating a civil war into a regional in inferno. Under the guise of restoring the legitimate government of uh, Mansour Hadi. So aerial bombing targets from border stations, shelling from the sea. Yemen's tiny military base was destroyed early on by the Saudi-led airstrikes. And I want to just really quickly, again, define airstrikes, because we hear this also in, in Palestine. Airstrikes are uh, conducted by uh, entities or warplanes that are outside of the country. So you don't see Yemenis going up on warplanes and then shooting airstrikes downwards, right? These are foreign actors that are hovering over Yemeni airways that are targeting and, and bombing, okay? So I just, I'm sure everybody knows that, but I just, I, I need to, people to really, really understand that uh, Yemenis are not bombing themselves. Um, and since then, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and its coalition of war partners, which include Arab countries such as Kuwait, uh, Bahrain, Sudan, Egypt, Morocco, Senegal. Qatar was uh, booted in 2017 from the coalition. Uh, we're bombing Yemen. The coalition is backed and supported by the US, the UK, and other war partners who have been providing the coalition with intelligence support, targeting assistance. There have also been Green Berets, uh, US Special Forces at the Saudi-Yemeni border. Um, and, and until recently, until I want to say not recently, but until 2018, the U.S. used to re refuel Saudi warplanes mid-air. So that means that warplanes that are hovering, that are planning, you know, 
they're planning to strike, uh, they run out of gas, the U.S. will say, no, we got you. So we're going to come and refuel your warplanes so you don't have to waste any time in deplane. Uh, we, we got you while you're in the air. So unfortunately, after Khashoggi was brutally murdered by his uh, the Saudi regime, uh, that stopped. Um, but outside of that, in addition to military support, the United States under the Obama administration, which continued under, under Trump, provided a coalition with the weapons made in the USA by bond manufacturers, um, uh, by Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, General Electric, and Boeing. And if we look at the uh, amount of money, because we do know that there's so many factors, right, when it comes to sustained war. There's geopolitical reasons, there's interests, there's commerce, but there's also profit, right? So over 120 arms contracts totaling $120 million a month, for example. This is just during uh, under the Obama administration. Also in that same year, in 2015, the Saudi-led coalition imposed a naval and land blockade, blockade which severely restricted the flow of food, fuel, um, medicine to Yemeni civilians. So Yemen depends heavily on imported food for their medicine and fuel for up to 70 uh, 70 to 80 percent of the population's needs. So that that's a lot of, you know, that that's a lot of that's a lot of sanctioning, right? Um, from 2015 to 2022, over 400,000 Yemenis have been killed. Two thirds of civilian casualties are due to airstrikes. So, like I said, Saudi-led U.S.-backed airstrikes. Yemen is considered the worst humanitarian crisis of the century. I know that Palestine is. You know, they're also dealing with something that is a genocide, obviously. It's a different, different than dynamics. Um, according to the Globe Hunger Index, they rank Yemen as the worst in the world level of hunger. And it's a man-made catastrophe. Like, you know, poverty uh, has been a, um, a situation that Yemen has been dealing with for a really long time because of, you know, previous uh, previous interventions, occupations, corruption, um, but the current situation is not something that is due to um, this is a poor country. This is a, a war tactic. Uh, food is being used as a weapon. Without America's support for the Saudi coalition, the Saudi Air Force would be grounded. Like they can't do it without us or, or, or Britain, right? Um, you know, fast forward a little bit to a couple years ago in 2022, a broker truce put a halt on Saudi led airstrikes, thankfully. Uh, so for the first time in about uh, over 70 years, they, there were no longer Saudi-led airstrikes, but the blockade continues. Um, so it is actually, I wanted to mention, so does the occupation of parts of southern Yemen by the United Arab Emirates, like their land grabbing, their resource and um, theft continues. Um, and I think uh, some of the, la I'm going to go through where we are today, but before I mention that, you know, Yemen is a sovereign country which essentially means no other nation or entity has the authority to control its territory. We're always hearing war proponent, proponents talking about the Ansar Allah, Iran-backed, Iran-aligned, which is a deliberate use of language to plant hatred against Yemenis. Because anytime you mention Iran, respectfully, the Middle East's uh, biggest boogeyman, it's an easy low blow to the issue. Like, you know, politicians, those that, that have the power to make, uh, to pass laws, that's it. They 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 hear Iran. They're like, okay, we we can indiscriminately bomb this country. Um, but Yemen's history, ever since the British Empire, has proven that they don't take kindly to invasions, to occupations, and any level of foreign control, even from our fellow Arab uh, neighbors. Right? The global community is being led to believe something that is not true. Iran is an ally to Yemen. That's without a doubt. But they don't speak for Yemen. It's highly offensive to rob Yemen's agency and reduce their autonomy to merely being. A proxy. I, I think Washington uses uh, such labels to largely rationalize for the U.S. support of the genocide, uh, the bombing campaign by the Saudis and the Emiratis. Yemenis rule Yemen, period. So updates on recent events in November of last year, Ansar Allah and the people of Yemen as a whole, right, decided to stand up and support Palestinian Palestinians, leveraging the only thing that they have blocking Israeli-owned ships entering Bab al-Yemen Strait. And how did the U.S. reply? So how did the U.S. reply? Instead of the U.S. realizing their mistake and taking a stand with humanity, they doubled down 
and back Netanyahu. And on the same day that the ICJ takes Israel to court, Biden and Sunak of the UK and other war friends, another coalition, uh, began bombing Yemen without congressional approval. So this is another American-led illegal bombing campaign on Yemen. Um, and to add insult to injury, the following month, the World Food Program cuts aid into the north, northern part of Yemen, where over 80% of Yemenis live, uh, and where they rely on aid as their lifeline. So here we are in 2024. The US and the UK are illegally bombing Yemen over commerce and to provide political cover for Israel while a genocide is taking place on the people of Palestine. In one month, the US has attacked Yemen 400 times in just one month. Aid is being used as a weapon and we're not done because just last month, Biden threatened to designate uh, Ansar Allah or the Houthis as terrorists after revoking this move. So Trump leaves, right? He's like, okay, then Ansar Allah are terrorists. So Biden comes in, he's like, no, 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 they're not. <laughs> and then last month he does, actually just yesterday, just yesterday, um, uh, the State Department uh, designated Ansar Allah as uh, specially designated global, global terrorists. And, and then I quote what the State Department says. He said, today the designation of Ansar Allah as a specially designated global terrorist took, took effect in response to their continued attacks on civilian ships in the Red Sea. And then he goes on to say that we remain committed to ensuring that humanitarian related assistance continues to flow to the Yemeni people. It sounds like the State Department is talking from both sides of their mouth, right? So they, yeah, we're going to sanction you, but also we're going to support humanitarian eff uh, efforts. So like, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? Um, and and lastly, this is becoming, this is a problem. Why? Uh, because the U.S. envoy to Yemen, Lender King, made an official announcement yesterday stating that this designation will be blocking the salary payments uh, to over one million Yemenis in the public sector. So this was actually part of the Saudi-Yemen peace deal uh, for Yemenis haven't been paid, salaries haven't been paid since 2016. So, um, you know, the U.S. and the U.K. and other partners are uh, actively trying to spark a regional war uh, to avoid um, stopping a genocide. And I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Jihan. Um, that was an excellent way to bring us up to the present and um, sort of showing how Yemen's solidarity with Palestine is extremely at incredible risk. Um, and they have taken um, sort of steps that uh, require serious sacrifice um, and, and sort of shows the depth of uh, the revolutionary solidarity that they are modeling for the rest of the world. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to all three of our panelists. We're ready for Q&A. Um, we have so far um, just a few questions, but we also have questions that I think um, are totally open to to discuss, including um, why Yemen is is uh, engaging in this in this solidarity with Palestine. Um, but uh, first of all, I'd like to ask from the audience. Um, I have a historical question about Ansar Allah slash the Houthis. Um, do they draw on the historical memory of the former Zaydi imamate, the one prior to the twentieth century Kingdom of Yemen, in their messaging? If not, why not? Um. Yeah, who'd like to take that? I feel like there's there's a lot there. Uh, I can take it if you if that's okay. Perfect. Go for it. Um. So. <clears throat> um. Actually, the Ansarala do not explicitly touch like draw on the historical me me memory of the Saidi imamate for the simple reason that the movement is you know at, at least de facto dedicated to republicanism right so in Yemen eh, republicanism is sort of the one thing that unites most people not to say that there aren't 
uh, monarchists or citizens that uh, feel some sort of uh, connection to the former monarchy because many many people or some people do find or do think that the monarchy was like so, some, some sort of um, rare stable period in the country's history which is you know understandable given you know in that context but politically um all major forces in the country even belligerent forces subscribe to one or you know their own different interpretations of what republicanism or yemeni republicanism entail um so the ansarullah is at least in word and so far also indeed dedicated to both maintaining the republican system of the country but also in many ways um in many ways you could also argue that they are uh improving the system right so there have been i mean you you can discuss the effectiveness of those programs but there have been programs to tackle uh internal corruption economic corruption political corruption um but also agrarian reforms, economic reforms, that are all meant to to in the in the end strengthen the republican system. So, so that's really I guess the the answer to that question that the movement is dedicated republicanists at the very least. I can add on to that. Um, the question was why not? I think the uh, you know you ask Yemenis, especially the elders. Uh, the imamate period was an exclusionary practice. Um, they had exclusionary patterns that uh, a lot of folks were not represented or seen or respected or valued. Um, so that, you know, if, if Ansarullah led with that, uh, I guarantee you that the, the people that they are, the, the territories that they're controlling will not be, it, it, they will not be in line with that, right? Um, so um, that that that's never been their their goal. That the the nineteen nineties Ansarullah movement was a uh, to promote a Zaydi revival, um, and it was also to defeat Western and especially Saudi influence because as the others have spoken before, they had the the Gulf has had for a long for many decades, um, or even you know yeah since the thirties you know before they struck rich before they found their 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 version of gold which is oil. They have been trying to have a political arm in Yemen. So um, that has been uh, their their mantra is to, you know, and that, that's why the majority of Yemenis are now okay with them, you know. Um, so that I don't believe that that is a goal of theirs and nobody in Yemen will be okay with returning to the MM8 period. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like we, we should touch on the Yemen's intervention in the Red Sea, um, because that's, I mean, really changed, I mean, it's, I'd say it's world historic. Um, so I guess I, I, I would ask why they are doing this. Um, what what is, what is driving the solidarity with Palestine? Um, and how has it changed the balance of forces in the region and internally um yeah and how has it affected the the genocide the ongoing genocide um and yeah anyone can take that take the last part um but uh, not the other part um you know the the degree to which israel and the us are able to escalate is based on the risk assessments and what they think will be the blowback. Um, and this is what partially conditions how much violence, not just Israel, but more specifically the US is able to bring to bear. Like, is the US going to send in extensive special forces? Is the US going to publicly, uh, going to directly uh, intervene in public ways, right? Is the U.S. going to uh, put pressure slightly on Israel in the back door, right? Is, um, uh, you know, is Israel going to rapidly escalate even further and send in more of its forces, right? Um, of course, the primarily primary deterrent uh, preventing that from from uh, from happening and, and uh, for the success of its violence to occur, of course, is the Palestinian people. But it's very possible that what uh, between what Lebanon has done and what Yemen has done uh, has prevented um, 
an accelerated attempt at ethnic cleansing, which would have, uh, you know, been a been an explosive, uh, probably exploded into a region, uh, an actual hot, full scale regional war, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, so uh, you know, Yemen has basically said to the U.S. and the British, and also the Saudis and the Emiratis, that if they go through, uh, if Israel really brought even more of its violence to bear in an attempt to extirpate. Uh, the, the armed brigades from the Gaza Strip, then what would happen? Then, uh, you know, the, the oil installations will be hit and the entire world economy will go into uh, an immediate depression, right? That's what would happen if, uh, if the oil prices spiked for a sustained period, right? So this was a huge, uh, this was a, a huge threat to their interest, and this is what's preventing escalation. We can't see it as well because we don't see the escalation. We see the lack of escalation, but we see it in uh, amidst a frightening amount of violence, right? right? But I think it would have been actually, I, I think it, things would have been even worse and, and more uh, disastrous if uh, if Yemen hadn't, uh, hadn't intervened. And I think it's also just part of the reactivation of uh, Palestine as a global cause. Um, and uh, it also activates Arab pressure. I mean, it activates Egypt. It, it, it puts Egypt in a very difficult position, right? Uh, maybe Sisi would have broken by now and, uh, and fully opened the door. I mean, it might be happening anyway, but it could have happened before uh, for accommodating refugees, right? So we can speculate because it's a what if, right? What would happen if they didn't? Whereas what we can see is that, um, in fact, the, uh, the doors are still wide open and Israel has been totally unable to achieve uh, its military objectives north or strategic objectives north and south. And so it's, it's very reasonable to think that the effort from Yemen has been a major contributor to that. Um, yeah, but I guess what remains from that little set of questions is, is, is why? And, and I mean, I say this just because it is, it is, you know, um, rare that we see this kind of thing, um, in the Arab world, I, I would dare to say, and, and, and just because of, um, long standing sort of comprador classes that have uh you know co collaborated with the the west and um i just i yeah why are they doing this and and is it um is it tactical is it like what is the reason would you say i mean i can try to answer that um i would i would ask uh why hasn't the rest of the world I would counter that question, but I think the the reality is the plight of Palestinian people has been a concern for the Arab world as a whole forever, ever since the inception of Israel as a settler colony. The sol solidarity is rooted in centuries worth of Arab identity, Arab and Islamic history. For decades, Yemenis from all walks of life, I remember myself as a child protesting and chanting in Yemen on streets of Ib, where my family is from all walks of life, ideologies and political affiliations pouring into the streets as we see now in the millions, uh, just what was it yesterday, uh, calling for a Palestine free from Israel's systemic annexation, apartheid erasure, and what the globe is now witnessing as a collective, uh, a televised genocide or the second Nakba. And I think, um, you know, yeah, get you a friend like Yemen, right? I, I see that a lot. We go to protests here and they say, yeah, Yemen, make us proud, turn an another ship around. But also realize that what the Yemenis are doing is they're putting themselves at immense risk. Um, uh, a country that is hardly recovering from a brutal seven year war. You know, the country's infrastructure is completely crumbled. Um, sanitation and water, um, you know, diseases have, have come back again, like cholera, dengue fever. Um, diphtheria, for example. So they're 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 losing a lot. They're risking a lot, a lot, and it's really because that solidarity. Like we have always known that the people of Palestine, like we're not free until they're free. Our liberation is bound, right? So, um, I I just I guess I ask the question: Why haven't other powers stepped up like Yemen have? You answered that beautifully. Thank you, Jihan. Um. 
there is a question that I uh, we have for Max about um, the the concept of freedom of navigation, um, which has been the sort of uh, framework that people have used around, um, yeah, what 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 why what Allah is doing is 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 wrong. <laughs> Um, and I'm curious, why is that a problematic concept? If that, I could also move on to another question. If that was, I mean, if that if that's an international law question, I have absolutely no idea. Um, if it's a uh, that's it's valid if it's an international law question to be clear, but I have absolutely no idea. Um, if it's kind of uh, if one believes rather that. Uh, what does one believe in terms of freedom of navigation? Like, what is, I mean, what does the term even mean? I mean, I think the question is to ask anyone who poses it a question, like, what do they mean by freedom of navigation? Do they, are they supporting the free movement of weapons to a, uh, to a murderous state? I mean, because there aren't, these aren't abstract principles, right? Is, are you committing to a defense that, uh, uh, there should be a freedom of ships delivering weapons to a state that's carrying out a genocide. If that's your principle that you uphold um, in, in the abstract and uh, in the concrete, then that's what you're holding up as freedom of navigation, right? Um, in fact, who believes in that? Well, in fact, nobody, in fact, actually, no one believes in freedom of navigation uh, in the concrete, right? Who believes in freedom of navigation? Everyone believes in uh, everyone uh, believes in uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Everyone humane believes in boycott, divestment, and sanctions um, against Israel, and believed it uh, in favor of uh, sanctioning and stopping arms shipments to the Contras and uh, South Africa, right? Um, and yeah, uh, on the other side of the, someone just put in the chat. I mean, on the other side of it, um, the U.S. doesn't believe in freedom of navigation. Uh, Israel doesn't believe in freedom of navigation for Palestine. So if the question is, could we have a world in which ships move around freely? Uh, that would be nice. Okay. <laughs> like, that's my response. Like, that's a nice idea. Okay, why don't we stop Israel uh, from, from stopping the movement of ships? So I just, I, I would just be like, I would ask somebody, I'd be like, I, I don't know what you mean. Like, is that, I, I don't know, like, you're talking to me about unicorns. Like, where is a freedom of navigation in our world? I don't know. Like, I don't believe in unicorns. Do you? Yeah, it's uh, sort of another example of how sort of international law is seen as being applied evenly when it's used as a tool for for empire. Um, there have been fascinating pictures coming out of Sana'a, the rallies in particular. Um, and sort of a resurgence of what looks like, and from what I hear, um, is is good is new grassroots organizing among the the, the socialist left in Yemen. Um, and I'm just curious what sort of openings and conditions the current um, the current sort of situation in Yemen has. Uh, or has created for the socialist left um, and what role Marxists play um, in the situation in Yemen, if any. Um, yeah. And anyone can take that. And, and you can also, you know, take that historically. Um... Yeah. I mean, I, I can try to answer that question. Um, so there might be some need for at least a little bit of historical context, right? So Ali Abdullah Saleh and Saudi Arabia tried their hardest in the mid-1990s to rid the country of, you know, socialist organizers, trade unionists, um, senior members of the Yemeni Socialist Party. You know, you had a plethora of assassinations, basically left, right, and center, right? Um uh, and then the socialist movement hasn't really recovered from that crackdown uh, ever since. I mean, it's not it's not you know analogous to the uh, state power that they held in the south from '67 and until 1990, right? I mean, or not '67, 1970s until 1990, right? Um, 
they've never really recovered. I mean, they've all, they've all, they've always been a socialist presence in the country, organized, um, you know, around the Yemeni Socialist Party and also the, um, the trade unions, the agricultural, uh, cooperative unions, um, uh, in general terms, but, um. Where the the, the the socialists in Yemen are very much still divided, uh, and it was a division that we saw early on when the war in Yemen began, you know, in 2015. So you had essentially the social democrats or the liberal centrists wing of the Yemeni Socialist Party siding with the Saudi-led coalition. On the other hand, you had um, hardcore. A, a mixture of hardcore Marxists, uh, former, uh, uh, you know, government functionaries of the, what was then South Yemen, and trade unionists siding with the Ansar Allah. And they claim to be, of course, the Yemeni Socialist Party. They don't even recognize the, the, the one that sided with Saudi Arabia. And they've always, did this, you know, pro Ansar Allah branch of the Yemeni Socialist Party has, have, has always had a, a a a visible position in the Yemeni political landscape, and it's not to say you know they they always frame the Houthis as having near total domination of, of the regions that they control, but it's the exact opposite. You have a coalition system, a coalition government where the Socialist Party plays an active role. And you have had socialist uh, organizers also taking part in the armed struggle on the front against Saudi soldiers, the border guards, uh, Sudanese soldiers, and and you know various mercenary groupings. Um, so the Marxists are, at least in the Ansar Allah controlled areas, they are present, but it's more of a question of whether they are visible because they too also subscribe to the general idea that the Ansar Allah, you know, proclaims, especially when we talk about uh, goals of, of uh, combating foreign imperialism, colonialism, and, and the reinstitution of national sovereignty, political and economic national sovereignty. And that's really what they are attached to at the moment. So they are part and parcel of the Ansar Allah, if you will, because it's the Ansar is not, you know, it's not a vertically organized movement. It is very much horizontally organized grassroots level. Um, and the left in Yemen plays an, an active role in that, um, so to speak. So, so the question might be whether they're as visible as, as one might have expected. But I would just then say that they're not, you know, that visible considering they are also part of, of this movement. The Ansar Allah. So, so yeah, there's a. Um, I feel like there's been. This is sort of a similar. It's a similar thing that's happening in 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 Gaza, where you know, um, we're seeing. Sort of, a, a resurgence of of like the PFLP. Um, I see. The, the kind of socialist organizing that I'm seeing in Yemen was would, would have been unthinkable um, when I was growing up. Sort of that that over overtly, um, yeah, sort of in the streets, um, out in the open. It's 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 really fascinating. Um, I have a question that I think is about fr the framing of the conflict. Um, analogous to how the imperialist media frames the uh, Israeli aggression on Gaza as a conflict between Israel and Hamas. It also frames the aggression on Yemen as a conflict between America and Britain on one side and Ansar Allah on the other. Um, what objective does this framing serve and how do we con combat that framing? I mean, this is why I think we need an uh, anti-imperialist framework and an anti-colonial framework to keep things in perspective, right? And an anti-capitalist framework, in fact. Because, uh, you know, 
theory is not so we can like uh, have a lot of books and hit each other over the head with them, right? I mean, theory is to give us lenses uh, that help us better see the world, to explain the world to one another, explain the world to our comrades and our friends and our family and act in the world in pursuit of a world that's big enough for everybody, right? And we need theory. I mean, theory is just a guideline and it's helping us understand, right? You know, of course, these labels are correct. Right. There is a Yemen, there is an America, there is a Britain, like they're fighting, right? Uh, there's an Israel and there's a Palestine, they're fighting too. But we say, okay, we're well, using this framework of settler colonialism because it actually ex explains to us that there is a question of uh, one set of people is actively denying uh, any sort of, to the other any dispensation over their own lives and over the productive use of the natural resources. And furthermore, that the invading force is organically linked to uh, a system of accumulation on a world scale that is, is premised on uh, the devaluation and stunting and distorting of, of human life and the systematic pillaging of, of the third world, right? To, to give a, a very quick summary, right? And these are tools that allow us to make coherent explanations about what's going on. This doesn't mean we ignore the particularities, specific, specificities and, and historical context of, uh, of Yemen. And when we explain what's going on, it just says, okay, we're not just throwing facts at the wall, we're, we're putting facts in it, we're using these theories and concepts to put the facts in a coherent order to tell us where we are in the world and uh, what to do about what's making this world bad, who's trying to make the world better, uh, how we uh, perceive and message and explain who is acting to make the world better and who's acting to make it worse, to put it in very moral terms. Um, and uh, th this gives us tools to say, yeah, of course, Yemen is in fact in a, a conflict with Britain and America because it's firing uh, rockets at them and they're supporting the destruction of Yemen uh, for, uh, you know, directly uh, through the arming, but also before that, you know, through their backing of Saudi Arabia for, for very many, many decades. But, uh, you know, uh, there's a reason for that, and that's because they're acting in solidarity, which all serious scholars would basically admit, um, except for, you know, malcontents like nincompoop Gregory Brew, if you want to see like a clown show of like uh, some U.S. think tank funded buffoonery, you can follow him on Twitter. But, you know, uh, this is what everyone understands as... Um, you know, th this uh, th this just helps us understand how to act in the world and understands that, yeah, they're acting in so solidarity and this is part of it. And they're also acting in their own interest and the understanding that, you know, as they have said very clearly in their message, we want to act, uh, we want, this is, we're, we're going to institute a new law, which is a law, uh, you know, it's like something like a law where genocide will not go unpunished or something like that, right? They're actually being very clear that it, it's a very clever use, uh, inversion of the kind of the Western uh, universalism and say, actually, we have a new universalism that's going to be based on this uh, emanating from the logic that's animating our intervention in this particular struggle. And that is how we fight for the universal, not the universals that you're trying to offer us, which are just covered in, in the blood of the third world, right? So I think that that's what we should, uh, that's why we have these tools. And that's why, that's why they're valuable, right? They're not valuable because like, um, yeah, because they're like baubles or trendy or something. They're valuable because they help us see things. If I can add on to that just briefly, um, I think um, the, another counter question, if I may, uh, framing according to whom, right? Everyone has an agenda, right? I mean, all of us, like we we are anti-imperialists. That's our agenda, anti-war, right? So of course the West is going to use messaging and framing in order to justify illegal bombing campaigns, in order to justify their backing of a genocide. The U.S. will not even... Uh, um, will not even reconcile with it being the first settler colony itself. Like we are living and standing and myself included on indigenous land, right? So um, this framing is old, to, you know, um, but I think that we, all of us here, we have the power to frame as well, right? We can use our uh, social media or our organizations to uh, reframe that narrative. Uh, there is a geopolitical interest in Yemen uh, wanting to control Bab and Mendeb Strait, whether it's Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and Israel right now, right? Uh, it's the, false, the, the fourth most important trading route in the world between Somalia and Yemen. Uh, you know, strips of water uh, that, that uh, connect two large bodies of water. Over five million barrels of oil flow through it daily. So there is a lot of money to be lost. It's, it's the gateway to the Red Sea. So of course the framing is going to be uh, such that is going to justify this because Congress has already told Biden, like this is this move was not okay. We didn't authorize this, but 
but he's going to frame uh, his decision in a way that will justify um, violations of, of international human, human rights laws, as somebody had said earlier. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate the frame that you uh, brought, Jihan, about the sort of continuation of um, settler colonialism and, and the imperialism that's happening in, in in Palestine and in Yemen, um, there's there's a continuity there, um, and 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 one of the continuities is that these are these are questions of land, um, and so yeah, I appreciate. I think I think it's important and difficult to hold that in mind. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm. Um, I'm curious about, and this is this is a question that's a little nerdy about um, sort of political economy in in Yemen. Um, I saw that Ansar Allah um, were sort of talking about these uh, agricultural cooperatives, um, and um, I guess yeah, how what has Yemen's economy been like since, and I would say since sort of the the dawn of of like neoliberalism. Um, what has the United States' relationship to Yemen's economy been, um, and um, how have sort of different forces, whether it's the socialists, whether it's it's Ansar Allah, how have or whether it's you know sort of uh, modeling of Hamdi, how have Yemenis resisted uh, neoliberalism as a force um, economically and politically. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Yemen used to be agriculturally self-sufficient for hundreds of years, basically, um, through and, and developed their own sort of. Uh, methods to cultivate the uh, cereal grains like uh, wheat and 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 other necessities um, that were beneficial for for the people right and they could also go out and and, and sell it to to uh, to local markets to earn a a a uh, a living the problem is almost immediately after um the republicans rose to power in the north they the country was or foreign powers, especially the U.S. And, and the U.K. and others, and with the help of Saudi Arabia, tried to force or did force Yemen into this neoliberal Bretton Woods paradigm that the country simply wasn't ready for. Um, because what you essentially had was a, a cooperatively organized agricultural industry that has you know hundreds of years of, of 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 cultural significance in the country essentially being replaced by an economy forced from the outside that made yemen dependent on uh, uh, foreign imports for basically every uh, necessity um right now or or at least that was uh, ali abdullah Saleh's legacy is that you know by the time he he passed away, Yemen was still ninety or ninety five percent dependent on foreign imports, um, and that never used to be the case for the country. What essentially what Ibrahim Al Hamdi did when he rose to power in nineteen ninety four was to take all of these um, autonomously organized um, agricultural cooperatives and organizing them into one uh, national agricultural union that would you know. Not only would it um, uh, make sure that these cooperatives weren't, um, you know, at the receiving end of some foreign dubious uh, economic incentives, like like the U.S. trying to uh, uh, take over the the the, uh, the efforts of the cooperatives, like with some sort of funding with with. Uh, with strings attached, like we've seen, like the uh, like USA doing for the most part in the country. But what he also did was that that the cooperatives that used to be independently, not only independently organized, but also had their own independent policies of how much to 
to, to cultivate and 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 to, to to what degree he essentially unified all of those cooperatives under one single policy that the state would dictate basically so if the state said you know that the country needed so and so much produced per year it was now up to the cooperatives to to really corroborate those demands for for agricultural production um but when ibrahim alhamdi pa or was assassinated in 1977 it was you know one puppet figure after the other you know they had uh, ahmed al ghashmi who who was like president for a year and he was also assassinated and then ali abdullah saleh uh, what they did was essentially bring yemen right into the fold of this neoliberal paradigm that would essentially make sure that the country would forever be economically enslaved basically is what it is um so that has really been you know yemen has has not been sufficiently developed to to, to be a, a a a a benefactor of the neoliberal uh, economic um, system that they were you know forced into almost with the bayonet of an m16 rifle from the U.S. Embassy, so 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 that's really also one of the problems that that that, that the Ansar law also has taken up to mitigate, is to rid the country of, you know, all of its, all of those strings that have been attached by Ali Abdullah Saleh to this paradigm, you know, um, make sure that the oil conglomerates, the oil corporations, remain firmly in the hands of the state because Ali Abdullah Saleh, you know, before he was overthrown, he was trying to sell them off to to foreign stakeholders and and and, and other uh, uh, big uh, uh, corporations. So they made sure that, you know, especially the oil sector would be state owned at the very least and put a halt to, to Ali Abdullah Saleh's scheme of selling off whatever little um, you know, um, sector Yemen had left to rule over. And what they also did was to reignite this or reinstall this uh, agricultural industry that used to be corroboratively driven. So they've been very much, you know, trying to where there was a need to establish those agricultural cooperatives so they could, you know, be self-sufficient and feed themselves and also contribute to the local economy. And it's through that um, idea, especially centered around agriculture, that they believe Yemen would have a chance, a real solid and significant chance to develop itself from the agriculture. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that the U.S. essentially is also very much opposed to, because, you know, with being included in this Bretton Woods paradigm also means that the U United States gets a piece of the cake, if you will, and and not only economic influence, but also political influence. Um, so yeah. I would I would just add just really briefly when it comes to the economy of Yemen, um, uh, when Al Abdullah Saleh took the um, or or backed Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War, um, Yemen's economy. Um, face severe consequences. Uh, not only did millions of Yemenis, uh, they were um, expelled from Saudi Arabia, uh, which a lot of Yemenis do, you know, migrate there to try to make a living because of the, uh, you know, kind of crippled economy because of all the various reasons that Orini mentioned. Um, but um, so that was a factor. And then also, um, you know, Ali Abdullah Saleh was trying to like fix that relationship. So he was um, kind of lobbying to try to get more aid to fill his own pocket. And what he actually also did during that time is allow for um, all these, um, you know, the unmanned drones to, to continu continuously hover and bomb uh, Yemenis. So not only is the economy impacted, um, but also our our sovereignty, right? So like n you cannot go any other sovereign nation and hover or monitor, you know, that that is not legally, you know, allowed, but Abdullah Saleh opened those doors and they have not closed ever since. Yeah, I, I, um, I think when we talk about how reliant Yemenis are on food aid. Um, that is the 
product of a long history of, of a, you know, sort of global destruction of their uh, agricultural economy um, and in and, and many different phases. So I appreciate both of you bringing, bringing that up and, and how deeply tied it is to sovereignty. Um, Aisha Jaman um, points out that the World Food Program has stopped food distribution in North Yemen to 9.5 million people in December 2023. Um, so, yes, I um, I'm gonna wrap. I'm gonna wrap two questions together, and then um, maybe we can go to closing remarks. Um, or rather, okay. I do want to ask this because this is sort of um, related to the strategic situation in the conflict, um, which is, <clears throat> unfortunately, the ship seizures go both ways as the UK and the US have routinely seized Iranian oil tankers in the Persian Gulf, along with their Do ships delivering arms to Yemen, which have been intercepted um, and their cargo redirected to Ukraine. Going forward, will resistance forces be able to counter these interventions while continuing to exert the cost on the occupying entity in Palestine and their backers? Um, and then I'll and then I'll ask the, the final question after this one. Massive. Logistical and material and technical capacity to continue um, the the all, all sorts of armed operations. I mean, look at what's you know the Gaza Strip is the least strategically advantaged place and the least logistically advantaged place for fighting a war on probably the face of the earth, um, and is is continuing. Um, so I I don't think the uh, I think there are one there is an ability to counter the interventions, and I think that there's no shortage of ability to um, exert costs. I mean, I think the limits of action are are currently more uh, uh, more political. There's still great asymmetries in terms of um, probably Yemeni capacity to uh, fully um, carry out targeting operations because there's still asymm asymmetries in terms of uh, technological capacity on uh, on Sarala between the, the British and uh, American forces. But one, it's actually narrowing rather than gaping wider. I think that's one thing. Uh, and it's been very clear, as we've seen um, in terms of the technological capacity, that even the uh, armed forces in Gaza are deploying in terms of, a, for example, taking down drone technology, right? I mean, all, what we see is a closing on all scales constantly of the technological gap in terms of, the, even though there's a constant attrition and draining of um, material reserves. Um, but uh, how that will develop, I mean, that's pro that's probably just the tendency, unless there's just a catastrophic war. And if there's a catastrophic war, then then just all bets are off the table. And, you know, we don't know what will happen. It will be, uh, it will probably be uh, the end of a lot of life and, a and also of, of the imperial control of the region, both. Thank you. And then, um... Yeah, I'd like to sort of wrap two questions together, which is, um, yeah, what, what, there are, you know, very many deliberate misconceptions about the blockade, about unsought of law. Um, the U.S. media has a very, um, I mean, they, they claim that it, it, it's, it's, um, they're doing it for no reason, no discernible reason. Um, so, what can we do about these misconceptions, first of all? And second of all, and this is sort of a really like, so what kind of question, which is um, what can we do in the United States to be in solidarity with Yemen and their struggle for liberation from imperialism? Um, how do we support Yemen along with Palestine, along with the solidarity movements in Palestine? Um, what are the sort of, unique things about Yemen's struggle that uh, we can fold into our our activism and, and, and organizing. Um. Well, I, I would say to the um, to the framing of the um, blockade as being w without reason or, you know, the, the, the Western media and all of these think tank uh, idiots in DC aren't really you know, 
clear in, in what they say because I mean all it takes is to read a history book open any history book about Yemen and you would immediately figure out that the blockade that the Ansarullah currently is imposing on, on Israeli UK and US shipping has a historical precedent I mean it's not the first time that Yemen is doing this even you know in during the October War of 1973 it was South Yemen at the time who took up the task of blocking Israeli shipping from, from the Red Sea you know, by by uh, reinforcing uh, artillery units on on the island of Perim, you know, right at the uh, right at the gate of Bab el Uh and it was a blockade that lasted for a month. Um, and and you know, all, you could also say it included the the uh, the uh, direct support and backing of of the Egyptian army. But but still, there's a historical precedent for it. And and you would also have to look into, you know, if you understand the Yemeni people, you would immediately figure out that. Palestine and Palestinian solidarity runs deep with the people. It is um, politically intertwined, culturally intertwined, and religiously intertwined with the people. It, I mean, the, you, I mean, Palestine and Yemen are two things that cannot be separated. So you would also immediately understand, and and that's you know one thing that I would also like to touch upon is. When the Ansarullah did this in November 2023, you had the entire people supporting it. Even people from Al Mahra in the far east to the south, uh, uh, you know, Aden and, and other places, Hadramaut, you had people supporting what they were doing despite their inherent political and maybe also religious differences. So that just goes to show how exceptionally loyal the Yemeni people are to the Palestinian people and to the Palestinian cause. They see the Palestinian cause very much as intertwined with their own liberation, as Jihan also mentioned, right? That Yemen cannot be a fully independent, liberated nation if Palestine isn't, right? And that's just, you know, all of these... All of these, you know, in, in in black suits and tie that, you know, go out and visit State Department and, you know, shake hands with, with the Blinken and all of his uh, loyal minions. Like they, I don't know what, what it is that they're missing out on. I, I mean, it, it doesn't take that much effort to, to realize this. But, you know, uh, you know, they haven't realized it at all. And I, 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 I don't think they ever will. Um, so yeah. And I just answer uh, for those that live in America, um, where have you been? Because the Yemeni Alliance Committee has been pushing back against the Saudi-led uh, intervention backed by the US. So, you know, on the one hand, this is almost like a bittersweet moment because Yemen has been silent, deliberately silenced, forgotten for for many years. And deliberately because because of the framing, right? Because of the censorship, because of the political cover and the lies. Um, so follow us, you know, and we have been, um, and, and if you do any lobbying or advocacy, we have a toolkit that will help you with talking points. We have actually, uh, because of our work, we have been pushing legislation. And in 2019, we had a huge victory where we helped push a war powers resolution through both chambers. It was bipartisan. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Trump vetoed it. We do know because the, the, the uh, American hegemony has a legacy of endless wars, right, and war profiteering. But we, we're still doing this work. We're actually pushing, pushing a war powers resolution as we speak right now in order to check the presidential overreach of Biden and whoever, whoever comes after him. It doesn't matter whether it's left or right, blue or red. It doesn't really matter. It's the system that has allowed endless wars, right? So I, I, I ask you to, you know, come, come join us. You can be a volunteer. You can help lobby. We can send you talking points. Uh, we have been doing this for a long time. Thank you so much for that, Jihan and, and, and Rune. Um, yeah, I'd like to, um, I think we can transition to final closing remarks if people have any last thoughts before we close out um the floor the floor is yours i i don't know who would like to start but 
Maybe I can start really briefly. Um, Thank you, James. You know, we, we mentioned a lot of stats, a lot of numbers, and we've almost maybe some of us Yemenis have been desensitized to talk about these numbers, but I, I just want to really lift up the human aspect of this, that these numbers are people. They're my people who had dreams, who had hopes and goals like all of us here. We all worry about our families, right? We we plan out their education funds and we want them to have the best of opportunities. Um, and the people of Yemen are no different. You know, they, yes, they're resistance fighters and they're warriors and they're resilient, but they're also human people, right? Uh, children born in 2015 are, have only known war. So we don't know what the uh, mental health implications will look like for those Yemenis that will, you know, are going into teenage years or will become adults. There's a lot of reconstruction that is going to um, be necessary. It, it's it's it was sort of in the process, um, but unfortunately, we're being bombed again. So um, I want to leave you with Yemenis are human people. Um, they're not robots, <laughs> even though they uh, seem so amazing that nothing will stop them. And they have the morale, um, the emotional and spiritual morale. Nothing will stop them because they believe in something greater than just this world, right? Uh, of people that don't fear death, um, but they're still people. So um, uh, these are your takeaways. Um, lift up Yemen in your advocacy. And if you don't know how to do it, please follow us, uh, the Yemeni Alliance Committee. We're on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as well. Donate if you can. I know, you know, it's, it's hard times, but if you have the financial capacity, um, in the chat there is my uh, dear friend, Dr. Aisha Jom'an, who is the president and founder of Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. Foundation. It's the only nonprofit organization that we endorse because not only uh, our war uh, bomb manufacturers making money, but also NGOs are, and that's a, a topic for another day. That's why I will only point to YRRF if you have the monetary means to donate. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Jihan. Um, Max, I see you unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Um, for those of you not in an organization, why are you not in an organization? And for those of you with a friend not in an organization, why haven't you brought your friend to join the organization, right? That is the basic way we can change anything, right? Otherwise, this knowledge is just knocking around in our heads. Um, you actually have to get together with other people, and like um, engage, right? There's just, there is not another way to do it. Not enough of us are active in organization. So that's that's my recommendation. Thank you so much, Max. Boon, if you have anything to say. Yeah, so I would close this off by highly advising people to uh, dig into Yemeni history um, and really read about what Yemen has been forced to go through for all of these years. I mean, stretching back to 100 years. Um, because what one would eventually realize is that what we are seeing right now, not just the blockade in the Red Sea, but also the current war in Yemen and the blockade and the killing and the suffering is all part of of this history. I mean, it's very much interconnected and interlinked. And Yemen has for so long been a forgotten country and a neglected country and deeply understudied criminally understudied country um so my advice is at the very least that i advise people to if they have an, a vested interest in the country and to follow the political affairs the economic affairs and the human affairs too you know if they have a vested interest and in also interacting with the people they are extraordinary people and i speak from experience from having you know uh been in contact with with many of them for for so many years is that don't just start with 2014 start with the history and and then really you know dig deep into it and you'll see um not just what 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 they've been forced to go through but also the incredible potential that the country and the people have in general um and i i do believe that just to to finalize here 
is that one of the reasons that they've been so embattled and bombed and, and pushed around is that so many powers fear a Yemen rising from the ashes and fear a Yemen that is self-sustaining and independent. But nevertheless, we are inching, I believe, at the very least, closer and closer to that goal. And I just can't wait for a future where Yemen is able to take care of itself without being threatened by any power or any force. So, yeah. This has been such a fantastic panel. Everyone, I feel honored to 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 be here with you all. Um, I yeah, I'd really love to uplift all the resources um, that we have on the screen right now. The uh, the toolkits for Yemen Alliance Committee are are amazing. Um, it's amazing work. Uh, I also want to shout out Aisha Jaman and salute. Um, amazing work um yeah i i guess i have uh some moderator privilege to have the last words um i just want to thank uh max jihan Un. um i'd like to shout out mira and, and and jorge and matt and brian and craig and andrew for doing the work behind the scenes um getting this ready um and i also just i would like would like to say that it is it is surreal um this 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 moment where people are paying attention to Yemen, um, and I think uh, Jihan mentioned that it has been, it's been it's been nine years of 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 horrors, um, and 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 sort of, uh, it, it was it was, it's less lonely now, um, and I think it's it's uh, it's really it's really moving, um, and I also just like want to express sort of my gratitude to the the Palestinian people um for 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 that and if there's nothing else I think we can I think we can call it I believe long live Yemen long live Palestine thank you all for joining us today <laughs>